Okay, so welcome everyone. My name is Nikita Sakmono, and I am one of the, this year's C, uh, grad co-chairs. It is so great to see you, um, but at first I would like to start with a land acknowledgement. Um, Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gaiacono, the Cayuga Nation. The Gaiacono are members of the Polinozoni Pet Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of the Gaiacono's dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Gaiacono people, past and present, to these lands and waters. Welcome so, to everyone who has come in person and those joining us from Zoom. It is such a pleasure to welcome um, our speaker for today, Professor Jeffrey Robinson, in person, um, who's come from so far, and we are so excited to hear your talk today. Um, so for all those joining us either in person or uh, online for the first time, um, the Ramon and Jeanette Bags Lecture Series, also formerly known as the Ron Bags, is a weekly lecture series partially funded by the U.S. Department of Education, held every Thursday at this time um, during the academic year uh, at, here at the George uh, King Center for Advanced Research on Southeast Asia, which elicits a lot of engaged conversation between scholars across all disciplines in Southeast Asian studies. And so we are so honored to have a speaker here in person during these difficult times, and we thank you so much for your patience in this hybrid uh, form that we're having this year. Hello, um, I am E. Uh, Elisa Domingo Patike, one of your uh, co-chairs, and it is our honor to welcome uh, Professor Robinson. Um, Jeffrey Robinson is a professor of history at UCLA, where he teaches and writes about political violence, genocide, and human rights, especially in Southeast Asia. His major works include The Dark Side of Paradise, Political Violence in Bali, East Timor 1999, um, Crimes Against Humanity, If You Leave Us Here, We Will Die, How Genocide Was Stopped in East Timor, and The Killing Season, A History of the Indonesian Massacres, 1965 to 66. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <laughs> Robinson earned his BA at McGill University and his PhD at Cornell, where he was a student of Benedict Anderson and George Kamen. Before coming to UCLA in 1997, he worked for six years at Amnesty International's Research Department in London, and in 1999 served as a political affairs um, officer with the United Nations in East Timor. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> his current projects include a co-authored visual history of the mass violence of 1965 to 66 in Indonesia and a study of the Swedish connection to those events. This year, the George McTee Kagan Book Prize was awarded to uh, Professor Robinson for his monograph, The Killing Season, A History of the Indonesian Massacres, 1965 to 66. So if you would, if you would please give me, uh, give us a warm welcome uh, to Professor Robinson, just bring that applause since we have pretty much a full house here. Oh, thank you so much for that kind of introduction and thank all of you for being here. It's very strange to be in a room full of people. It's even stranger to be giving a lecture with a mask on, but I hope with the help of the microphone and my elocution lessons as a child, uh, you'll be able to hear me. It's a, it's a real honor to be back here at Cornell um, and in this building in particular where I finished uh, the manuscript for my first book um, many years ago. I won't say exactly how many years ago that was. Um, but being here also gives me a chance to say thank you, to thank uh, my mentors, George Kahn, Audrey Kahn, and Ben Anderson. Through their example, they taught me that it was all right to be an engaged scholar, that is to be a scholar and a citizen. In fact, they taught me it's not just all right, it's not just okay to be an engaged scholar, it's kind of a responsibility. Anyway, without that lesson, I would not probably have taken the path I did, but would certainly not have written the books that I did. They were an inspiration and I want to thank them. 
But let me get on with the talk that you came here to listen to. As many of you will know, um, in a period of about six months from late 1965 to early 1966, roughly half a million members of the PKI, the Indonesian Communist Party and other leftists were killed. Another million or so were detained without charge and some of them, many of them were subjected to torture, including rape. This was one of the largest and swiftest cases of mass killing and incarceration in the 20th century. And some have called it genocide. The targets of this violence were ordinary people, farmers, teachers, day laborers, artists, writers, civil servants. And they were killed in gruesome ways, decapitated, castrated, their dismembered bodies left in public places. This was not a civil war. Those killed and detained were not armed and all belonged to what were at the time lawful political and social organizations. In fact, at the moment of its annihilation, the PKI was the largest non-governing communist party in the world and it had no armed wing. The violence stemmed from allegations that the PKI leadership under the name the September 30th movement had conspired to kill six senior army generals in a failed coup attempt on October 1st, 1965. Based on that unproven claim of PKI culpability, the army and its allies began a campaign to destroy the PKI and to overthrow the popular left nationalist president, Sukarno. The campaign was led by Major General Suharto, pictured here a few days after the coup. The consequences of this violence were far reaching. In less than a year, the PKI had been crushed and President Sukarno had been swept aside. In their place, a virulently anti communist army, uh, army leadership seized power signaling the beginning of more than three decades of military-led authoritarian rule in Indonesia. In its scale and its significance, the violence of 1965-66 was comparable to some of the most notorious campaigns of mass killing and incarceration in the 20th century. And yet this violence remains largely unknown and misunderstood outside of Indonesia. So for example, the World History Project's entry for the year of 1965 includes the fact that, quote, Kellogg's Applejack cereal first appears, but neglects to mention the killing of half a million people in Indonesia. In contrast to many of the great mass killings of, of the 20th century, these crimes have never been punished nor even properly investigated. And there have been no serious calls for any such action by international bodies or states. The book uh, that I'll be talking about today or on which this talk is based, The Killing Season, aims to interrupt this disturbing silence and impunity. It examines the events of 1965-66 in an effort to understand simple things like how and why they happen, why so little has been said or done about it, and what the long-term ramifications of that violence have been. It also seeks answers to a number of historical puzzles that have remained elusive all these years. First of all, what accounts for the distinctive geographical and temporal variations in the violence? That is, why was the violence concentrated in certain areas, Central and East Java and Bali? And why did it begin and end at markedly different times in different parts of the country? Second, why, did, why in spite of those variations, did the violence take broadly similar forms across the country? Why, for example, did civilian militia groups everywhere play such a central role? And why were methods like mutilation, corpse display, disappearance and sexual violence so common. And finally, the last question here, 
Who was ultimately responsible for this violence? How did they get away with it? And what could be done today to bring them to account? I'm gonna to try to address all of these puzzles here today, but I'm gonna focus especially on the last, the question of responsibility. So Indonesian authorities and many other commentators have insisted that the violence of 1965-66 was the inevitable result of popular anger against the PKI, a kind of spontaneous frenzy, a collective running amok, fueled by deeply rooted cultural and religious passions. In that account, General Suharto and the army appear as national saviors, and the six deceased generals are heroes worthy of endless memorialization, as you can see in this monument uh, which, in which the six generals are depicted. By contrast, the half million leftists who died and the million or more who were detained exist only as unremembered phantoms who by virtue of their assumed treachery and their brutality, uh, their brutality in killing the generals are deemed responsible for their own annihilation. That characterization of the PKI is in this, expressed in this diorama that appears in a, uh, a museum in Jakarta. Powerful foreign states and former officials, when they've said anything at all, have tended to, to echo official accounts, blaming the PKI for its own demise, praising the army for restoring order, and vehemently denying their own involvement in the violence. My own view and the view of a growing number of scholars is that these claims are false and they do not offer plausible answers to the central historical questions posed just a moment ago. Just as important, maybe most important, they deliberately obscure crucial questions of responsibility. The explanation that I advance in the book highlights a number of historical dynamics that I think form the basis for a more satisfactory account of the violence and the matter of responsibility. So in the interest of time today, I want to just focus on two of those uh, dynamics. The first, the role of the army leadership, and second, the influence of powerful foreign states. After doing that at the end, I'm going to offer some thoughts on where we are today with respect to the question of justice and accountability. So first of all, the army. My claim here, just to put it right out there at the start, is that the violence of 1965-66 cannot be properly understood without recognizing the role of the army leadership in fomenting and organizing it. I don't mean that the army single-handedly carried out all the killings and detentions, or that it acted alone. That was not the case. It clearly had a good deal of support from political parties like the PNE and the NU, and it faced pressure from religious uh, groups of all stripes, of all different denominations, for action against the left. What I am arguing is that contrary to the official narrative, the mass killing and detention of 1965-66 was not the inevitable result of popular anger against the PKI, nor a spontaneous expression of deep-seated religious and cultural passions, but were instead encouraged and organized by the army itself, and in particular by Major General Suharto. Without the army's leadership, I argue in the book, the campaign of mass killing and incarceration would never have reached the extraordinary levels and intensity that it did. And probably it would not have happened at all. So the, the army's decisive role had a number of different um, dimensions of which I want to mention five. So the, the first, the army developed and disseminated a discourse of existential threat to the nation that provoked and valorized acts of violence against leftists. Through a carefully crafted propaganda campaign, it demonized 
and dehumanize the PKI and its affiliates, calling for them, for example, to be destroyed down to the very roots, annihilated and crushed to bits. In one of its more outrageous propaganda offensives, the army and its allies portrayed members of the leftist women's organization, Gurwani, as witches and whores who had danced half naked while castrating the six generals with razor blades. In doing so, in spreading this kind of propaganda, they gave license to the party's enemies to do the same. And I would argue they provided an essential ingredient in transforming existing conflict and tensions into violence. Second, the army developed a plan to, to detain, transport, categorize, interrogate, and prosecute vast numbers of leftists. And crucially, they provided logistical assets to put that plan into effect. Soldiers and civilian militia groups were supplied with weapons to be used in detaining and killing suspects. Suspects bound and tied were transported to prisons and execution sites in military vehicles. Soldiers and militias used hit lists to locate victims for target, targeted for arrest or execution. These, I want to emphasize, these were all clear signs of a carefully planned military operation, not a spontaneous explosion of anger. I just want to point out, here's one of those lists here. That's the commanding officer at this scene of arrest in Jakarta. And of course, the truck, the military truck. Third thing, while the army alone had the organizational and logistical capacity to implement a nationwide plan to destroy the left, its capacity was not unlimited. And that uneven capacity helped to explain the geographical and temporal patterns that I described at the beginning. So for example, in some areas, the army faced resistance from local authorities, thereby delaying or derailing the implementation of the central army plan. In Bali, for instance, the governor and the regional military commander balked at central army directives, resulting in a two month delay in the onset of killings until they were removed. By contrast, in Aceh, where the local population, I'm sorry, where the local civilian and military leadership were united in their support of the central command's plan, the violence began almost immediately. And so to reiterate, the, army's, the army, army leadership's uneven capacity to mobilize local allies helps to explain both the geographical and the temporal variation in the violence. Fourth, to multiply its, its uh, force and to cover its tracks, the army leadership mobilized and trained militia groups to carry out mass killing and incarcerations. In the vast majority of cases, militia, these militia forces operated with the full knowledge and usually under orders from army commanders. It was through these army-backed militia groups that longstanding religious, cultural, and socioeconomic tensions were transformed from conflict again into violence. Interestingly, I think the, I think the army role in mobilizing and training these militia groups also helps to explain their remarkably similar repertoires of violence, what I call their repertoires, the kinds of things they do when they go out and commit acts of violence. These remarkably similar repertoires of violence, such as disappearance, sexual violence, mutilates, mutilation, and corpse display. Well, I just want to point out here, in case you didn't see it, this is a militiaman, but of course, this is all taking place uh, under the uh, orders and with the assistance of the, uh, of the army. The collaboration there is captured in that photograph. Finally, having seized power, the army was free to write and popularize a falsified history that glorified the perpetrators of this violence while blaming the victims. It did so in various ways, including show trials, uh, education, film, and public rituals that portrayed the PKI members as barbaric enemies of the state. 
One of the most disturbing examples of that propaganda was the pornographically violent film, The Treachery of the uh, 30th of September Movement, PKI. PKI. That film portrayed the PKI as treacherous and sadistic, and it was compulsory viewing for all school children from the very youngest all the way through high school for 15 years during the military uh, period of uh, in power. The result was a profoundly misleading but remarkably resilient narrative that has penetrated deeply into Indonesian society and has proved, I argue, crucial in enforcing more than 50 years of silence and inaction. My second main claim here is this, that powerful foreign states were instrumental in fomenting the violence of 1965-66 and enforcing the long silence that followed. Key features of the international context and international environment had a similarly accelerating effect. Just to be completely clear, I'm not suggesting that foreign powers plotted the alleged October coup and the ensuing violence on their own. The evidence does not support that conclusion. Still, I think it can be shown in the, that in the absence of support from powerful states, notably the United States and the United Kingdom, and in a somewhat different international context, the mass killing and incarceration of 1965 would not have happened. That claim is based again on five main observations. First, in the period before the coup, there's now abundant documentary evidence that for at least a decade before 1965, the United States and other Western powers worked assiduously to undermine Sukarno and the PKI. They did so, for example, by providing uh, covert assistance, financial assistance to anti-communist parties in the elections of 1955. They did it later by surprise, providing military aid and even flying bombing missions in support of anti-Sukarno rebels. Then in the final year before the alleged coup, the US and the UK undertook a joint covert intelligence or counterintelligence operation to quote, create the conditions for a military intervention against the left. Among other things, they contemplated provoking a premature left-wing coup that would then provide the ideal pretext for a military intervention. In other words, more or less exactly what happened on October 1st, 1965. As this British uh, Foreign Office document says, in, uh, uh, an officer wrote in December 1964, a premature PKI coup may be the most helpful solution for the West, provided the coup failed. The documentary evidence also shows unequivocally that in the weeks and months after the October uh, coup, the US and its allies actively encouraged the mounting violence. They did this in a number of ways. They're listed here, let me just run through them. First of all, through a covert psychological warfare uh, campaign designed explicitly to, put, in their words, blacken the name of the PKI and Sukarno. They did it also by providing secret assurances of support to the army within days of the alleged coup. Thirdly, through the provision of covert assistance to the army leadership, notably that assistance, economic and military assistance, was calibrated to increase as the army demonstrated its uh, determination to crush the PKI. Is that me? <laughs> Who is that? You're responsible for it. Sorry. Jeff, can you no tell us some of the Cywar operations? What, like, what were some of those things that they did? Uh, the Cywar operations involved a lot of um, uh, um, the dissemination of false information. So the redissemination of stories about Gurwani, uh, the story that the PKI had um, tortured the generals. Um, uh, and the US and the British helped. They coordinated and they said, we have, we, I have some slides okay, that I didn't that. include that I can talk about later, but 
um, there's a, a significant documentary evidence of, at the highest levels, the British and so the CIA, but also MI6, they're talking about how important it is uh, to paint the Pigalle in, into a corner and, uh, and Soprano as well. The British documents say that the aim should be to ensure continuing civil war. They actually create, they, they're interested in creating a situation of violence and conflict, which then can justify the military intervention. Okay. Um, so, and then the last one uh, that I wanted to mention is the policy of strategic silence in the face of mounting army instigated violence against civilians. So uh, you have this you know, document, State Department document that says, until late March, 1966, our major policy in Indonesia has been silence. This policy remains sound, particularly in light of the wholesale killings that have accompanied the transition. These trans all of these interventions or non-interventions, I would argue, provided vital assurance. In fact, a bright green light to Soparto and his allies that they could move against the PKI without repercussions. The violence was further acceler accelerated by the broad international political context and more specifically the Cold War. In addition to accentuating political polarization inside the country, the Cold War shaped Indonesia's pre-1965 international relations, driving it ever closer to Mao's China after 1963. It was Sukarno's drift to the left, after all, that led the US and its allies to support the army leadership's move against him and the PKI, regardless of the cost in human life. And it was almost certainly because the victims were communists that there was then and still is today so little sympathy for them in the West. I just have this, uh, there are many, many ways of illustrating this callousness, but here's a, a note, a memo from the uh, US Under Secretary of State, George Ball, in early October. It says, the Indonesian business is developing in a way that looks encouraging. The Muslims have burned the PKI headquarters in Jakarta. They seem to be moving against the communists around the country, which indeed they were. For the first time, the army is dis disobeying Sukarno. If that continues and the PKI is cleaned up, we will have a new day in Indonesia. The violence was also facilitated, I argue, by the weakness at the time of international human rights norms, institutions, and networks. Perhaps the most important, most important was the near absence in 1965 of the transnational human rights and civil society networks that from the late 1970s began to play such an important part in efforts to stop mass violence. They virtually didn't exist in 1965. In the absence of such networks, the UN took no notice of the violence. Most states expressed satisfaction with, uh, with the results of the violence, the, its effects, and the mass media largely parroted official views. And so we have the New York Times in mid-1966 at a time when the extent of the killing was very well known, writing that the events in Indonesia uh, were a gleam of light in Asia. That was, um, what's his name, James Rustin, if anybody knows. Uh, finally, for over 50 years, powerful international actors have aided the Indonesian army's work of writing a falsified history of the violence and evading justice for the crimes committed. In 1968, for example, the CIA did something unusual. It wrote and published an account of the alleged coup that largely embraced the dubious army version of events. Later, a succession of former US government officials, including Ambassador Marshall Green, who was there at the time, and the CIA station chief, Hugh Tovar, and his colleagues published memoirs, mendacious memoirs, and articles that sought to divert attention from any possible US role, while also questioning the integrity and the political loyalties of scholars like George Kayan and Audrey Kayan, who disagreed with them. 
Meanwhile, key documents pertaining to the events uh, of 1965-66 remain declassified, and the U.S. and its allies have not supported any process aimed at elucidating the truth or seeking justice for the victims. These conditions have meant that unlike the survivors of some genocides, notably the Holocaust, the survivors of 1965-66 have been unable to generate meaningful world attention to the, these events even more than half a century after they happened. To sum this up, I'm, what I'm arguing is that responsibility for the mass killing and incarceration of 1965-66 and for the long period of silence and impunity that has followed rests squarely with the Indonesian army leadership and with powerful states and international actors. In making this case, I don't mean to suggest that personal motives, cultural and religious tensions were wholly unimportant in shaping the violence. Clearly, they matter, as I elaborated some length in the book. I'm simply saying that their significance was always shaped and circumscribed in decisive ways by the by the uh, wider historical context and by the decisions and actions of people in positions of political power inside Indonesia and out. So with the, there's, there's the Suharta family. So here we, I, I just want to um, turn briefly before I close uh, to uh, the question of justice and accountability. The news here is decidedly mixed. Um, let me begin with the bad news. More than 50 years after the mass killings of 1965-66, no National Truth and Right National Truth Commission has been established. No comprehensive effort to exhume the hundreds of mass graves dotted across the country has been made. No official memorials have been constructed to honor the dead. No apologies or reparations have been offered by the state. No proper judicial investigations have been undertaken. No criminal charges have been brought and nobody has been punished for the crimes committed. It's not hard to see why that is the case. After all, the perpetrators of these crimes remained in power for more than three decades after the events. And they continue to exercise enormous influence in Indonesian social and political life. This has permitted them to control the historical narrative and to obstruct any moves toward justice or truth. To this day, in fact, senior Indonesian officials categorically reject proposals for a truth commission or a judicial process. They speak dismissively about demands for an apology to victims. And they continue to propagate an account of the violence that glorifies its perpetrators as national heroes. You see this one, former Vice President, one of many quotations I could have up there, uh, giving you a sense of the callousness and the, uh, and the, and the position of, of government officials until now. Meanwhile, even the most benign efforts to uh, rebury the dead or to discuss what happened are routinely disrupted, often with violence, by anti communist thugs acting with official acquiescence. It's worth stressing here that while these events, this one is an, a kind of a half on, on a, uh, a seminar at the Legal Aid Institute, um, disrupted by people gathering outside and throwing rocks, um, these kinds of things are acquiesced in and sometimes encouraged by officials. But I want to emphasize that these angry reactions are not solely a matter of state policy. They, in fact, reflect something more worry, which is a profound antipathy to the left that has become very deeply rooted in Indonesian society itself. As Anderson and McVeigh predicted more than 50 years ago in their seminal work on the events of 1965, they wrote, whatever questions may later be asked, whatever counter arguments produced, people who absorb the view of the PKI as it is now presented will not be able to think of communists later, except as a group stained by atrocity and treason. And that remains as true today as it was in 1966. So there is some good news. In the past decade or so, a variety of non-governmental 
bodies and actors have begun to challenge the dubious official version of events and to demand justice. One, I'll do this very quickly, one important initiative was the investigation of Indonesia's National Human Rights Commission, which concluded in 2012 that in fact that there were crimes committed in 1965-66 and they amounted to crimes against humanity under international law. Now, the recommendations have been rejected by the government and ridiculed, but the remark, I think the report still marked an important step in the direction of acknowledgement and possibly accountability. In 2015, another step, uh, human rights activists organized an international people's tribunal on 1965, which convened in The Hague. Although it had no formal legal standing and it was again roundly criticized by the Indonesian authorities, it drew wide attention to the events of 1965 and remarkably and sort of novelly concluded that the violence had amounted not just to crimes against humanity, but also genocide. Even more encouraging in some ways, in recent years, Indonesians from all walks of life, not just people in large institutions and not just human rights activists, people from all walks of life have become increasingly bold and innovative and creative in their efforts to raise awareness and to challenge official historical narratives. So for example, an organization of former political prisoners has begun to locate mass graves and to organize their mass exhumation, their exhumation and reburial. And small groups of activists and survivors have created private memorial sites and grave markers like this one for the dead. Two things that the uh, government authorities have never done or had, had shown any inclination to do. Meanwhile, visual artists have begun to explore the violence critically in their work. Musicians have begun to perform works like Genjeb Genjeb, once banned for their association for the PKI. And school teachers have become increasingly bold and outspoken in uh, their view of the official version of history. In addition, more and more survivors have begun to follow Pramudia's lead and write their memoirs. Uh, if you haven't read it, I would strongly recommend it's available in English, read the lead soliloquy by Pramudia and Petur. But there are many others that have followed. Uh, in addition, filmmakers, Indonesian and foreign, have begun to explore the events of 1965 with greater nuance and empathy. And publishers, Indonesian publishers have shown a greater willingness to publish books that would once have been considered taboo, including this strangely happy looking book <laughs> by Jeffrey Robinson, which is now a What it doesn't show is that this is the first, this is the front, no, I'm sorry, the, the, the painting continues on the back and on the back in amongst its foliage is a body with a knife and it's bleeding all over the place. So it's not quite as cheery as this. Um, I just want to draw your attention to one thing here. You'll see at the very bottom, it says, So in order for this to be published in Indonesia, the publisher had to agree to have a general write the foreword. So some things have changed in Indonesia, but some things have not changed. So um, there it is, there's a, a foreword that, essentially says that well, this book is a pile of rubbish. Um, and then we can go ahead and read the book. Um, anyway, I was very grateful to him for writing that. <laughs> sort of made my point in a way. <laughs> now, um, you know, these initiatives that I'm talking about in the field of, of writing and, and art and film and so on, publishing, of course, they haven't yet created anything close to judicial accountability. But they have gone, I think, significant way for changing the conversation inside Indonesia toward and heightening awareness abroad, possibly creating an opening, of, uh, 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 an opening for new versions, new ideas about what happened in 1965 to emerge. Now, you may think, well, it's nothing if it's, if it's not justice in a court of law. I actually disagree with that. Um, we can talk, have that conversation later. But what I want to point out here is, a is one final point, which is I think there's a reminder in the Indonesian case that when it comes to accountability and justice, the path forward 
often requires action outside the purview of the state, outside of the courts of law, and outside of the edicts and, and uh, of the legislator or the, or the executive. So in contrast to the classic notion of transitional justice, in which a new state tries to remedy the violence of the past, in cases like Indonesia's, where the state is complicit and continues to be complicit in telling the false narrative, in cases like this, the most promising avenue may not be through that recalcitrant state, but through civil society. Okay, and all of this, finally, I'm just right at the end here. This begs the question of what, if anything, scholars and citizens should do. Do we have a responsibility, since I'm speaking today about responsibility? Are we off the hook on this? Well, one answer is that we should do nothing on the familiar grounds that it's better not to open old wounds, that we have no business telling other people how to deal with their own histories, and that so scholars in particular should not be involved in the subjects they seek to study. At the risk of breaching all of these norms, I want to suggest instead that there are in fact things that we can and should do. First of all, I think that we should insist that our governments, and I mean all our governments, even squeaky clean governments like Canada and Sweden. Any sweets here? You have blood in your hands too. That, makes sense. <laughs> that we insist that our governments help to clarify the historical record by opening their archives from this period immediately and without restriction. More than 50 years after the events, there can be no excuse for keeping those records secret. Second, I think we should demand that our governments and relevant, relevant international bodies, including the UN Human Rights Council, encourage credible investigations and where possible judicial proceedings against those deemed responsible for the crimes committed. It's unconscionable that they have not done so to date. And finally, leaving governments aside and leaving international bodies aside, I believe that we should do whatever we can through our scholarship, through our teaching, our creative work, our political action to disrupt the terrible silence that has allowed these crimes, for that is what they are, to go unnoticed and unpunished for more than half a century. It's what George Cahan did. And I'm sure he would want us to do the same. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Robinson, for your insight um, on such a veiled time in Indonesian history. Um, we'll now enter our Q&A session. We'll be alternating between questions on Zoom um, as well as open session. Uh, Professor, if you could possibly help reiterate questions for Zoom. Sure, audience. yeah. Uh, and if those in person, please try to speak up as much as you can. Um, that would be very much appreciated. So perhaps we can start with an in-person question. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. My name is Niliana. I'm from Myanmar. As you know, just like Indonesia, Myanmar has a military government, which there are a lot of people, ethnic groups, and so on and so forth. In Myanmar, all of this is a debate. So human rights activists say seen that where we show a really military into the justice, so on and so forth. But other moderate thinks that this is not the right time because we are in the transition period. If we are pushing too much, you know, the, the country will go back to the European state. So you have the debate. Should we wait or should we uh, start talking about the uh, human rights violation of the military? So my question to you is that, is it the right time in Indonesia or in Myanmar that uh, we should start discussing about the accountability and justice? Or should we wait until this country, Myanmar, Indonesia, begin the full democracy with a strong institution so that, you know, we can, we can do um, accountability? Because otherwise, just like in Myanmar, you know, Indonesia or maybe other transition countries, they can go back to the authoritarian state. So that's my question. Thank you for your question. So the question, the brief version of the question is, um, is it too soon to start talking about human rights, to be pushing for human rights, about human rights, whether in Myanmar or in Indonesia, or should we not wait, wait until there's a more opportune time once democracy has been established? I mean, I think you probably can guess my answer, which is that, um, the best time to do this would have been about 50 years ago. Uh, 
Um, and the next best time is now. So, and, and the reason I say that is not simply because I'm a human rights guy and I believe in human rights and so on. It's because I, I believe there's a pretty clear uh, record that the struggle for democracy to bring about tra transformation of democracy actually entails as an, an integral part of it, the struggle for rights of some kind. Democracy emerges on certain on the basis of certain kinds of rights. Now, historically, it hasn't always been the kinds of rights we talk about now, but they were rights of a certain class or rights of a certain category that pushed this demand for uh, in the direction of democratization. So I would say these things go hand in hand rather than happening in stages. Um, I, I think of you know, a number of cases uh, you know, in my career sort of watching these things unfold where people have said, now is not the right time, wait for a little bit. One of those was res with respect to Myanmar, in fact, about 10 years ago, or maybe it was more like eight years ago, I was in Myanmar and at a conference celebrating the transition to democracy. Uh, people were talking about how great this was. And I gave a speech, a, a talk, in which I said, great that you're making the transition to democracy, but don't forget about human rights. Um, and the reaction was very much along the lines that you suggested. We'll do this first, human rights later. And I just, I think we see now in Myanmar where that, how that ended up. Um, and certainly in Indonesia, uh, we're in a similar kind of Okay, I better stop there so we have more time. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have a question from uh, our Zoom audience from uh, Griffin Bauer. At the height of the Cold War, many Western governments viewed these killings perhaps as a victory over communism, but how have the Western powers changed their perspective on the mass killings many years later, if at all? Um, do you want me to reiterate that question? Or? I think you're fine. Um, okay. okay, so um, sadly, I think that the, the the position of most Western governments has not changed. And this may seem surprising because the Cold War is over um, and uh, you know, it wouldn't seem to be impossible to say, well, actually the, the threat of communism is no longer as vital an interest, uh, as a concern as it once was. But clearly the United States, the United Kingdom and other, other Western powers are not prepared to change their position. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One of them is that Indonesia is still a very important uh, economic and political and military partner in the region. People don't want to upset the current rulers in Indonesia who, as we've seen, are very sensitive on the subject. That's one thing. Another possible explanation is that they recognize that the United States, the United Kingdom and others were in fact complicit in this violence, as I've argued today. So to push for a thorough investigation is essentially to demand an investigation which will prove that they were complicit possibly in genocide or at least crimes against humanity. So naturally, they're not interested in doing that. Yeah. Um, tomorrow is a historian here. Hi, Um I really appreciate your book, and I'm, I'm glad you did a piano award and um, use it in one of our classes, which is also after one of Audrey and uh, named after one of Audrey and Berger's books, um, Subversion's Foreign Policy. Mm -hmm. And um, my, my, so I think the, the kinds of accountability that you're documenting are going to be hopefully useful at some point in the future. Um, my question has to do with um, the cultural narrative that was promulgated for 15 years and and from there kind of took on a life of its own within most of Indonesian society. Uh, and I think of a similar one in the context of Thailand, which is a cultural narrative about the king and royal family and how um, just powerful that narrative is within the culture itself and, and within individual people and their subjectivity, right, the sense of things. Um, one of the exciting things you see happening in Thailand now uh, is young people questioning that narrative um, in a variety of ways um, and countering the kind of establish uh, the status quo. Um, and what I noticed and really appreciated about it is that it's um, gendered and feminist and queer friendly. Um, 
and I don't see anything like that in Indonesia, which I don't follow nearly as closely, but um, the narrative that was spun about Gorlani, um, it seems to me kind of single-handedly um, blackened uh, any kind of feminist movement uh, in Indonesia from, from occurring. Even when we had someone come here from Indonesia to talk about feminist movements, she um, would use the term feminism in English, but if you ever looked at the screen, the term in Indonesian was always gender, which is not a feminist term <laughs> necessarily. So I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the long-term implications for um, kind of gender and sexuality in Indonesia when anything that has to do with feminism or questioning gender norms is automatically potentially tarnished as left. Um, it's a great question, Tamara. Um, I, I'll just say a couple of things. I don't know, I have a fully formed answer for you. Uh, one thing I should say is a somewhat more positive uh, portrait or understanding that I have, and that is that I think there is emerging uh, an awareness of just how um, how much that false narrative about their wanting, uh, how, just how important, how deliberately it was used in order to turn not only against the PKI generally, but against active activists, politicized women. Um, there was, I, if there are any Indonesians here, I don't know, the, there was a, a recent edition of the main weekly magazine, Tempo. Uh, actually, the front cover was the, the life story of uh, the Secretary General of Gerwani. Uh, a kind of look back at her experience, um, her bitter experience. She was arrested and raped in custody and so on. Um, and so that tells us something, right? That on, on the main daily weekly, the main weekly uh, magazine, there is a, a, an emerging consciousness of, of um, the particular role that that narrative played in demonizing the left and women. As far as Gerwani and feminism is concerned, I would say, I would broaden the point to, to say, and this is, I realize this is going to be somewhat unsatisfactory, that the narratives, the various narratives developed about 1965 actually have um, had an enormous impact not only on feminism and not only on women's movements, but also on all movements of the left. Any leftist movement has basically been tarnished in the way that Anderson and McVeigh predicted. Um, I think the hope that the, the reason that I still have some hope about this is that among those who are uh, working in creative ways to ups, uh, un, uh, undermine and challenge those narratives, uh, a great many of them are women who are, I believe, thinking not only in terms of you know, just the left as a whole, but also thinking, taking some clues from uh, feminist thinking and, and, and ideas perhaps from other countries. I don't suggest for a moment it's anything like uh, where you su suggest it is in Thailand, but I'm not unhopeful about it. Um, do you have a question from Michael Van? What are the real world security and safety implications for Indonesian and international scholars who work on 1965? I assume research visas are out of the question, but what other forms of intimidation might scholars expect? And are there any government or other allies for engaged scholars? What challenges do Indonesian scholars face? Um, you know, this is so interesting, this whole question of the, the dangers to um, international scholars, I'll, I'll start with. I remember when I was getting ready to go to do my research um, as a PhD student here at Cornell, uh, I was wondering what I should write in my application to the authorities at that time. It was still the new order and military government and so on. And I ended up with Ben and George's approval saying that I was interested in studying local participation and development. This is a way of, you know, and particularly I was interested in the 1950s and, and because I thought local participation in development at that time was so crucial in the founding of the new nation or some crap like that. So this got me past the censors, but it also left me feeling uneasy because whenever I went to speak with anybody, they wanted to talk about local participation in development, about which I knew nothing. So, but I also felt sort of it was an ethical, you know, dodge. And so I decided a little later, again, with 
advice, an advice from George and Ben that I should just say what I meant and let the chips fall where they may. And what was interesting about that approach is that it all worked out just fine. And people who hadn't said, hadn't spoken their mind by contrast, sometimes ended up suffering worse consequences than I did. Now, I know that George and Audrey were forbidden from traveling because they, were, they spoke their minds. It was a terrible injustice and it was a tragedy. Same thing with Ben, but it didn't stop them. It didn't stop the Cans, it didn't stop Anderson. And I, so I think in a way we should not as scholars be uh, overly concerned about that kind of, of thing if we are actually interested in, um, in living a consequential life as scholars. Um, as for the, uh, the situation for Indonesians, it's very interesting because you could, if you listen to, uh, to, to some of the stories that I've said and the things that officials say, you would think that it's impossible to do or say anything in Indonesia, but that's actually not true. It's a curiously fluid situation. You just don't know what's going to be okay and what's not. So the example of my book, the publisher said, yeah, we're gonna publish it. But then two weeks before publication date, they got a call from military intelligence saying it would be unwise. We advise you not to. And then they worked out this deal where the general would write the forward and it was left true. So there's not the same kind of, you know, grab them on the street and take them into, into detention situation. It's still in some ways very much like the new order in which people self-censor because they get hints and suggestions from the military that it's not a good idea to do X or to do Y. Uh, but it is still possible for people working inside Indonesia to speak out, to have seminars, uh, to have film showings. The Oppenheimer films have been shown hundreds of times. Some are disruptive, some are not. Some seminars about 65 are disrupted, some are not. So it's a it's a time, I would say, for people to be as courageous as they feel they can be, because there are indeed openings. Thanks so much for the presentation. Um, really great to see you. Um, I'd like to ask you about the sources that you mentioned that are, uh, I mean, obviously, you don't know some of the sources we haven't seen, but like, what are the types of things that are still not released on the non Indonesian government side? So, like, things in the US that are still being classified. What are, do you have, can you give us a sense of what, what is out there that we could learn that we don't know yet? But, like, what yeah. could you learn from that sort of documentary release? Yeah, I think that uh, probably the one that stands out for me uh, are documents from the Department of Defense, so military. The, the US military, because what we have had so far in all of the fanfare of government uh, of document releases, it's basically State Department and some CIA. The assumption there is that the State Department was you know, somehow at the heart of things. That in many cases, in this period, it wasn't. It was actually not in the know. So when some State Department or embassy officials say, gosh, it caught us by surprise, they may be telling the truth. Likewise, the CIA, uh, I think sometimes it's it's reach and it's intelligence. I mean that in both senses of the world, the word, uh, are overestimated. I don't think they necessarily, are, you know, were capable of organizing something like this. And so we have some of their documents, which are revealing of plans and intentions to overthrow and to and to undermine, but they don't necessarily tell us what happened. And to my mind, it's very curious in all of this, all of the government releases. There's virtually nothing from defense, from the US military. Uh, and so I, and that's leading me to suspect that there may be, that actually the channel of influence may have been military to military rather than CIA or state. So that's just an example of what we, we should be asking. For. If anybody has more energy than I do to request the declassification of those documents, great exercise for grad students. <laughs> Um, we have multiple people on Zoom asking about the connection um, between this history and Timor Leste. Um, one question is Is it an overrepresentation to suggest that the lack of uh, international ramifications for these massacres predisposed Indonesia to invade Timor Leste with similar brutality? Um, additionally, can you speak on whether Timor Leste's uh, CAVR process and Indonesia's normalization of relations with that state has created? Uh, increased openness on the violence of 65 to 66, since many of the same actors slash institutions are implicated in both atrocities. Okay, well, that's a big one. Um, 
The first question, I think unquestionably, yes. I think the lack of a reaction to 65, the, in fact, not just the absence of a reaction, but the, uh, the uh, military and economic and political support that was given to Indonesia after 65 uh, did make it much more likely that Indonesia could feel that, that they could invade East Timor without repercussion. But it's also the fact that in the days and weeks before the invasion, there were much more immediate green lights and guarantees given. So it's partly a historical question. It's partly just, well, President Ford and, and Henry Kissinger were in Jakarta and said, we understand your problem and we will not cause trouble uh, on that. So both of those things are true. Um, the second part was to what extent the normalization of relations with East Timor, between Indonesia and East Timor and the CABR, the Truth and Reconciliation Process, has increased awareness of 1965? Is that what the question was? Increased openness. Openness. Gosh, I'm not, I'm not really sure. I, I, I do believe that, uh, that Indonesian awareness, the awareness of Indonesian students and young people about East Timor actually improved the chances of East Timor uh, becoming independent. That the coalition between East Timorese fighting for their independence and Indonesian young people fighting for East Timor's independence was actually a crucial part of the puzzle. Whether East Timor's process of reconciliation and truth-seeking has led to more openness about 65, I'm less certain. Um, I, I don't actually, among the people that I read and speak to about 65, I don't see many of them alluding to, to, uh, to East Timor. I think they should be looking there for, for some kind of answers. And in particular, they should be looking and asking, how well have we as Indonesians done? compared to how well people raise have done, given the circumstances. Thank you. Um, you want to first? Um, I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to come down here to listen to your talk. And I appreciate your uh, 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 work on exposing this very troubling silence on this tragedy in recent South uh, Asian history. So I'm just curious as to uh, uh, based on your estimate about half a million, how many of these half a million casualties were actually non PKM members of the city ethnic Chinese that brought the brunt of traditional ethnic rivalry? Uh, uh, because uh, I'm sure you're aware that uh, there's tension between the successful Chinese businessmen versus the local Indonesian, and this kind of uh, uh, backlash was replicated again. Uh, in the 1998, Pretty complicated stories, but I'll try to give you a, a straight answer, which is that, uh, first of all, yes, some of the victims of killing and incarceration were ethnic Chinese, and they were uh, selected and targeted because of their ethnicity. But there's a caveat, which is that it wasn't typically mainly, it was not primarily ethnic Chinese who were targeted. In certain cities, Surabaya, Jakarta, Medan, some of the most sort of visible targets were ethnic Chinese, Chinese Indonesian. But where most of the killing took place outside in, in the countryside, ethnic Chinese haven't, hadn't been permitted to live there for five or six years. So I would say, I, I don't want to ha hazard a guess about numbers, but the vast majority of those killed and detained were not ethnic Chinese. Now that is not to underplay the significance of the targeting of Chinese Indonesian. It was an important part of the story, but there's one additional caveat that I want to add here, which is that they, that Indonesian Chinese were targeted for two quite different reasons. One, some were targeted because they actually were involved with the politics of the left. They were involved with political parties, funding political parties of the left. So they were targeted for their politics as much as their ethnicity. 
or together with their ethnicity, also their politics, their left politics. The other category were people who were maybe not leftists at all, but who were very wealthy, who were targeted for reasons of extortion. Um, we have a Zoom question. Uh, it seems the conflict between leftists slash communists and non-leftists was a huge political cleavage at the time. Would you say this cleavage persists to the same degree today? From a lot of scholarship I've read on contemporary Indonesian politics, it appears that the main political conflict has shifted to a radical versus moderate Islam difference compared to a right versus left dichotomy. I was just wondering if the contempt towards communism slash the Chinese is still as a kind of nowadays. Hmm, that's interesting. Uh, I don't think that, they, that the political debate really centers, is really can be described as left, right. But there's another part of that which you would suggest at the end of that question, which is that the antipathy toward the left is still very, very deep. I mean, it's still there. What happened, as far as I can tell, is that there, it was so successful, the campaign to not only to annihilate the PKI physically, but to annihilate it as an idea, to annihilate communism and leftism as an idea and as an institutional presence was so effective that essentially wiped out for some time any possibility of organizing or mobilizing or even speaking in leftist terms. It's still, now it's true that among some smaller, small group of younger people and some academics and some creative types who I mentioned, there is a growing kind of desire to, to reconnect with that earlier history, which is the history that dates back to the beginning of the century. Um, and to say, you know what, that too was Indonesia, that history, the PKI, leftism, anti-imperialism, that's part of who we are historically. And it's a pity that we lost it in this cataclysm in 65. So, but that doesn't, hasn't translated into anything like a politics of left versus right in Indonesia. I guess there are people here who know a lot more about contemporary Indonesia than I do who may want to speak to that. Thank you so much. Um, as we're approaching the end of our time, perhaps you can take one more person question if there are any. Thank you very much. I'm so glad to be here today. And I think you emphasize the role of international organization to bring in light to the whole Massacre. And my question is like, I think we tend to like think of international human rights, this in Barca, but it's not that like the contract is somewhere having the place. So, and since it's very decisive, it could be like even oppressive somehow to define the ancient justice by victims or by groups of organizations. So, if you can tell me a bit more about it. Um, so, the, the process to adjust him. The definition of international justice and justice required by Indonesian people. Yeah, so uh, if I understand your question, it's about the um, how to navigate the different requirements and needs of, let's say, of justice internationally and domestically. Is it something like that? Um, yeah, I mean, the problem here, of course, is that um, quite a lot of um, international law as it pertains to human rights crimes against humanity and genocide, um, begins with the premise that the judicial process should start domestically. And only in the event that, uh, that a domestic jurisdiction, that domestic courts, national courts don't do their job, is it appropriate for any kind of international um, court or uh, whether an ad hoc tribunal or some other kind of court to step in. Um, this is um, particularly difficult in the Indonesian case because we see that, of course, national courts haven't taken up this case, but international uh, mechanisms seem to be unavailable. So particularly uh, institutions like the International Criminal Court don't, uh, are not, have no role to play because the events in question took place long before the court was established and before the the uh, statute that established it was, was set in motion. So there is a question about, well, what international body could conceivably do this? First, because we, I don't know what it would be. And secondly, they would have to do it over and above and against the will of the Indonesian authorities. Um, so you have this, you know, there are certain situations where courts, ad hoc tribunals are established in Cambodia, in Timor, um, Rwanda, and so on. Usually 
those come about because there has been a change in power. And the authorities are, that are present at the time eventually agree that it's okay for an ad hoc tribunal or some kind of judicial mechanism, international judicial mechanism to be set in motion. But we don't, we're not there yet in, in Indonesia. So I guess the, the challenge will be, you know, in perhaps in another generation, to have a generation of Indonesian leaders and, and uh, people in the judiciary who say, you know what, we welcome uh, an effort jointly between our uh, legal apparatus and international community to look into these things and to establish some kind of um, uh, judicial process. The International uh, People's Tribunal that was done in 2015 that I mentioned was a kind of, you know, it's, a, it's, it's like a mock trial. It has no, no real legal authority, but it gave a sense of how uh, a, a, a proceeding and a judicial proceeding might go. Um, and I guess that's encouragement to some, but I personally think that there's an awful lot of other work to do before we could ever expect um, an actual judicial process in the case. So um, I just want uh, to add that and thank you so much, um, Professor Robinson, for this incredibly moving um, talk of yours. And um, just wanted to ask if you had any um, closing remarks you'd like to share with us before. Oh gosh, I think I said <laughs> quite enough. Um, yeah, no, I, I just, I sort of, I guess my appeal would be for people who are lucky enough to be here at Cornell and have this amazing building and to um, and to be part of the Southeast Asia program to do your best to live, live up to the legacy of this place because it is a pretty remarkable place and it's a place that George Kane himself set in motion uh, more than gosh 70 years ago 60 five years ago so remember who your ancestors are uh, that that is beautiful and just um as they thank you i'm just going to <laughs> turn this over to our in-house audience and see if the Cahin here could give a warm, like a round of applause to Professor Robinson. So much love from the Cahin Center. <laughs> so thank you, Professor. Thank you. And, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, so just to, um, to let you know, um, Please enjoy your uh, well-deserved fall, fall break that's coming up. And please, if you can, join us on Thursday, October 14th at 12.15 p.m. here at the Cajun Center for our in-person talk with uh, Dr. Nian Fu, who is right over here. <laughs> so if you'd like to wave so that the folks that the audience can see, uh, or the audience can see, um, uh, the, his talk will be um, titled, What Happened in the Myanmar Election? So um, this will be a very, very powerful talk I feel as well. So um, just a reminder, all the books um, back there are like in the back table and in the joint room um, are free for the taking. Um, there is a very large, I believe, dictionary that I've, I've just kind of been wondering who will take home. Uh, <laughs> and uh, just feel free to browse and take your pick. And we hope to see you all again after a restful fall break. Thank you so much.